。时隔七年，再次和自己的博士导师聊学术，是一种怎样的体验 ？Hello， 大家好，我是老师啊。今天这期视频厉害了，有幸邀请到了帝国理工学院的 George Constantinides 教授，和我们一起来谈谈心。他呢是帝国理工学院电路和系统研究组的主任，工程学院的副院长。对于我来说啊，还有一个特殊的身份，就是我的博士导师。我们聊了人工智能和可重构芯片的未来发展，以及他如何看待学术和科研，也分享了他对读博的见解和思考。其实啊，这期视频是我去年回国之前拍的，写 paper 会各种拖延，结果做视频也习惯性的割了。不过今天看起来啊，我依然仿佛回到了当年读博的时光，并且深受启发，也希望大家能够从中获益。话不多说，接下来就是我们的对话。Hi George, uh, thank you very much、uh, today for for accepting the invitation、uh, for the interview.、Um, how's going today? My pleasure, and、uh, nice to see you. Yeah. Yes, it's been a long time, right? Since we since we chat like a few years ago when I graduated.、Uh, it's been always been a pleasure、uh, to talking with you and discussing all the kind of meaningful stuff. So,、uh, so yes,、yeah, so、let's jump into it. So there are some questions that I I always would like would like to ask for you know long time.、Um, the first is you know how. Would you define yourself? You know, you've been involved in many things. You know,、um, uh, research, and I know you have particular interest in you know, in addition to FPGA related things, you're also interested in the math、uh, related stuff. So, how would you, you know, characterize yourself? Define yourself as a mathematician or electronics engineer or professional, all that kind of things.、Mm. I mean, it's an interesting question, right? So, I, I think probably I would I would define myself as a professor. Right. I mean, I, I think, I think in terms of what I like to do, and what I like to do is I like to think about things. Right. So,、um, for me, that's that's the natural way to define myself. And and I don't really like so much the、um, pigeonholing of of different disciplines.、Um, you know, I've always worked across boundaries,、um, mainly. Uh, computer science and electronic engineering, also bring in some maths, as you said. And, and I think probably the most exciting places to work usually are across boundaries, right? So、uh, I think you know some kind of disciplinary boundaries are important because you need to talk to people who understand you. But but I think I, I prefer to work across them. So I wouldn't I wouldn't put myself in any one pigeonhole. I would just say I'm a I'm a professor and I like to think about interesting things. The research, like you've been conducting, like you said, is combines a lot of you know area disciplines. So can you provide a little bit more about the research, like you've been doing? Oh, I know quite a bit, but I would like to know what's the you know the latest thing about your research, and、uh, a bit further more about like the group、um, at Imperial, and、uh, yeah, so so yeah, a bit more、sure. around on that. Sure. So、um, so I guess kind of locally in terms of the things that I. Think about research-wise, day to day,、um, and that I'm very involved, you know, in the details of.、Um, I would probably say I focus a lot on、um, automated design.、Um, so I'm interested in automated design of very fast, or very small, or very low energy、um, compute,、uh, computation. And、uh, and within that, I think really the key aspects that I focus on are、um, memory systems and numerical behavior,、um, and and that's been the case for a while. The different、um, different application areas change, and with them they come different challenges. But I think、um, the the problem of automated design for、um, for small, fast, low energy. Um, uh, computation by minimizing the amount of data movement that you have, and by、um, by using the best way of representing that data that you can. These are are really my my passions, my interests. So this is kind of the the the, the day to day aspects of it. And then you you asked about the group more broadly. So、um, so at Imperial. As you know,、um, I lead the circuits and systems research group, and so circuits and systems is much broader than that.、Um, and so we, we really cover all aspects of analog and digital、uh, IC design, 
and their applications. And I'd say the analog people, they primarily focus on biomedical applications um, and the digital uh, activity is primarily focused on FPGAs, as you as you know. Um, and so, so, uh, and then I guess, you know, you can go even, even higher level. So um, within the Faculty of Engineering, um, I, I, I have a, a management role there as well. And, and, and across the, across Imperial's Faculty of Engineering, there are a few kind of st key strategic aims that we're, we're looking at. We're looking at uh, the future of zero pollution economy. We're looking at um, resilience and security in the infrastructure. We're looking at AI and ML. Um, we're looking at the impact of aging on our society and so on. And, and I think when you get down to the kind of uh, level of the basic research that's happening uh, that I'm interested in, that I, that I do, um, I think it can be applied to most of those things, to be honest, because it's a kind of fundamental research. So, so that's that's really interesting to me. So yes, that, that's the key, isn't it? So like the fundamental stuff, as you said, can be applied to many things, not necessarily in a small area, and it can be applied to multidiscipline uh, things like theoretical, combined with you know a specific you know application area. So in terms of the theoretical uh, research topic. Um, so why theoretical or, like I said, math uh, research um, makes you, you know, interesting? Why, so what attracts you or interests you in pursuing uh, research in that kind of area? Right. So, I mean, um, partly, I think, because it's long lasting. Um, so if you make some kind of uh, um, advances at, a, at an abstract level, um, then often they'll live for many years, uh, you know. Whereas if you if you make some advances in um, a very practical level, then often they're tied to a particular technology that might um, come and go within a very short window of time. But that's not to say that I'm not interested in having kind of short term and, and practical impact, right? I'm very interested in having in having short term practical in, impact. So for me, the the most exciting research really is is ones where I can really think deeply about some of the abstract theoretical problems, but then bring back the lessons from that to have a real impact on day to day, uh, on day to day, um, you know, technology. Um, so, for example, um, some work uh, that uh, that we've done has made it into many handsets around the world, right? Mobile phone handsets around the world. and and that's actually come from some theoretical insights into how to represent numbers that's then come back into and been used into in the in these products and that's a great feeling right so yes. um, you know ultimately from my from my perspective there are really two drivers and uh, well there's one driver right what to do that makes me enjoy myself right so so let's think about that and the things that the thing that makes me enjoy myself right is is number one to think about things because I get a buzz about solving problems, and number two is to see those uh, other people get excited and use those things. Right. So I'm really interested in both these sides. But I feel like if you want to make, you know, impact that lasts over decades, then you really need to think in in abstract terms. I, I totally agree. I think abstraction is always the key to making, you know, fundamental thinkings, right? So you have to get rid of all that kind of meaningful, meaningless stuff, focusing only on the most important questions uh, in abstract way, right? But uh, in that case, on the other hand, right, it raises a lot of problems. For example, theoretical problems cannot be, you know, can sometimes not be that realistic. If you, you know, too abstract, right, for example, um, many people are actually talking about, uh, you know, in China, so actually talking about the EDA softwares and all that kind of stuff. Because I remember, like, in your group, like, you used to be doing the, the set solver or some math related thing. I see you also doing some formal reasoning about, um, you know, memory relation, memory behaviors, or, um, you know, place and root, high level synthesis, all that kind of stuff. So, so in comparison to actual engineering problems, and how's the theoretical, you know, one question is, what's the, you know, 
reasonable stage of abstractions. How did you go to? Is it too abstract? And then you get rid of the real engineering problem. But if it's too realistic, you only focus on the surface, not the meaningful core. So how did you balance those two? Mm, I think that's a very insightful question, actually. So, um, well, I think the way I would the way I would look at it is 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 again around around breadth of of impact. So. I, firstly, I think it's it's fair to say there's no right answer, mm. yeah, um, to that question. Um, it's not that to look at things at a very detailed and concrete level is wrong. It's not wrong. It needs to happen, and someone needs to do it. The question is, do I want it to be me, right? Um, and and equally, the, um, the the question of you know pure abstraction. So, for example, um, looking at the asymptotic behavior of a particular um, implementation rather than the behavior around a range that might actually be useful um, is also very interesting and very useful. Um, so I don't think there's a right answer. Um, so I guess for me, the, the, the question is what kind of time horizon am I looking at um, trying to make an impact in that particular field. And honestly, that may be different between different uh, different pieces of work. So for example, I may be interested in um, improving a certain way of designing a data path um, over a three year period because I have a student who's trying to make concrete industrial progress in a three year period, right? Or it may be that I'm trying to um, that I'm trying to look at questions of what's a meaningful abstraction of memory uh, as your number of um, as your number of computational units approaches uh, the trillions. These are very different kind of time scale uh, pieces of work, and I think the level of abstraction needs to move with that. The reason I'm asking this question is because I see people is actually comparing some of the um, uh, the research in different countries, right? So many countries actually, you know, the research is more focusing on um, the, the not really theoretical part, but more on the the innovation or the academic part, if you like. And many other people is actually focus on the engineering part. Um, to, to myself, these two doesn't really conflict with each other, right? You, you spend 90% of your time doing engineering stuff doesn't necessarily not necessarily mean you can't publish good papers in top you know journals and conferences. So what do you think? So like the combinations of engineering and research, how do you you know combine those two into your research? Yeah, so I think that's I, I think you're absolutely right. That's the that's the perfect um, so combining this is is the perfect way forward. Now um, the question really is what resources you have available to you as well, right? So um, if you are in Intel, say, um, and you're sitting uh, in, in, a, um, in a group that's working in a particular area, then um, you, you tend to have, or you know, take, take Google, Google's AI group, who I work with, for example, you tend to have um, different forms of resource, right? So what we have, um, at Imperial are very bright students, right? Great students, you're one yourself. Um, we have um, really outstanding faculty, um, full of ideas. Um, we don't have you know, the, the, the millions of uh, compute hours of, uh, of, uh, of server time that you know, Google AI would have. So um, how do you make the best use of that? Well, you either focus on the things that that you're going to provide best impact for and just work alone on that and i have some work that that does that because i think that's interesting work or you team up so that you have some people who are working at the more abstract level some people that are working at the more concrete level and so that's why i've always tried to work with industry as well because i think that's right one of the best places to get that 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 bridge um between between the abstract and the concrete between um, between the impact and uh, and the ideas, mm, I resonate with that. You know, uh, to my to myself, like recent years, I think 
because uh, I got the experience of both academia and, and the industry. Um, so I, th I think the academic, like I said, like proving I uh, providing ideas and the proof of concept, probably, like a proof this idea is actually works. But for industry, like got an army of engineers, and you got a seas of computing resources, all that kind of stuff. You, if you're combining both, they will do much better optimization than you did, you know, than students or, you know, and they will have too much, you know, a lot of in the industry experience. So they can, you know, optimize your ideas to the next level or production level if it's ever going to be production. So I, I do resonate with that. Absolutely. So, and the and the other thing on that is that um, it's very different than create, creating um, uh, a proof of concept as versus creating some, some uh, piece of IP or tool that can be used by other people. Yes. Um, and both in terms of the kind of engineering effort that's involved, but also in terms of support, right? And so one thing that we definitely um, don't have and don't want to spend our resource, limited resource on in an academic environment is to support end users. But it's a huge part of industry. And if you really want your ideas to get used, then you need end users to be supported. So how do you yeah. do that? And I think teaming up with industry is probably the best way to do that. Let's jump into the more specific you know, research stuff like the FPGA related stuff. Um, so what do you think uh, current uh, you know, main research area of FPGAs in both you know, academia and the industry? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, obviously I have to say machine learning, right? Because <laughs> yes. um, it's, the, it's the, the, main, the main area that's dominating a huge parts of um, not just FPGA um, research and development, but processor research and development and software engineering research and development um, and even the theoretical computer science, you know, uh, uh, ML is really everywhere. Um, so I think that's the obvious one. Um, the other area that I would say is, is very common when I look at industrial R&D in the FPGA space is also network-based computing on large scale, right? So, um, how you can roll out from ideas that are often developed at uh, individual FPGA level to networks of devices. Um, but I, I think there are so many interesting problems right now, and I don't think ML has really created them, but it's emphasized them um, uh, in terms of scale, in terms of numerics, in terms of memory, all the things that I was previously interested in. Um, ML has now provided a fantastic playground for these ideas, right? So, so that, that's really exciting to me. So, so in that sense, so what do you think um, the advantages of uh, using FPGAs or combining FPGAs and ML or AI, whatever term it is called? Right. Um, so, um, so I think the so the kind of main advantage for FPGA-based compute here is um, so in in edge based computation um, what we're really looking for is really high performance um, but we're also looking for very predictable timing behavior um, and also low energy consumption and so really fpgas tick those boxes um, high performance predictable timing low energy um, and so in, if you're looking for deploying um, deploying machine learning ideas at the edge, they seem like a natural choice for that. Now, the other thing that I would point out is that um, the, the, there's always a question about where about the level of abstraction at which you define um, your specification. And so, um, if you look at say um, at a very low level of abstraction in high performance computing, for example, uh, maybe you define a library call as correct if it produces a certain um, uh, you know, inverse matrix, for example, uh, correct to, to, to the precision of the computer. Um, typically in ML applications, the, that's not the level of abstraction that people care about, right? They care about things like notions of accuracy um, you know the the, the uh, how accurately does this classification uh, work, and and notions of um, 
of non-functional behavior like um, like the performance and the uh, and the energy consumption and so on and so if you start saying well I'm interested in whether this thing classifies a pedestrian correctly at least this proportion of the time this is a very much higher level of abstraction than if you specify things like this must be correct to two decimal places or something right and so what that means is that for those of us who are interested in the both the software and the hardware there's a huge amount of scope to rethink what's under the level of that abstraction to get the best possible implementation much more freedom and that of course means well number one a lot more scope for interesting research, right? But number two, it means um, a lot more scope for reducing the energy consumption, shrinking the circuits and so on. And so that's why I think it's really exciting. Mm. Yeah, I do see one of the interviews you done with uh, Imperial, um, one of the on YouTube. So it's mentioning in comparison to human brain, right? So it's, a, it's which is, you know, um, big super computer and which only costs very small, tiny bit of uh, you know energy. There's still a large gap. You know, the, the theoretical limits is still way ahead of you know what we achieve today. Um, so, what do you think um, the efforts? What efforts can be done to you know close the gap between the current stuff and the theoretical limits? Yeah, I mean, it's a very big question, isn't it? Um, there are people thinking about exactly that question. So I point to research groups in the UK, like Steve Ferber's research group in Manchester and so on. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I don't know the answer to uh, what the future technology will be that underpins future AI and ML. But I do know, uh, or I believe that um, that whatever it is, you know, whether it's silicon based, whether it's chemical uh, computing, um, you know, whatever the underlying technology is, there'll be a few things that, that are pretty certain. Number one is it will be massively parallel. Okay. And number two is that it's not very likely to in include very high precision computational elements in the common, uh, in the current way of thinking about it, right? And so, and so I feel like although our work is based on FPGAs, um, which is a CMOS uh, process at the end of the day, mm -hmm. um, even if we look to uh, molecular computing, chemical computing, something in the future that's totally different, I think a lot of those lessons carry directly across. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think the research will kind of live for like 20, 30 years after that point, because those that parallelism and that lack of um, precision with compute really, really carries across um, uh, naturally. And that's the beauty of, you know, making certain levels of abstraction, isn't it? So like you decouple the actual research, you know, problem with the underlying hardware or, you know, platforms or whatever, you know, computing it, right? So as long as you, you figure out what's the right problem to solve, it doesn't really matter what's the the actual implementations or application is, isn't it? So, so yeah, that makes sense. So you also mentioned about another research topic uh, in FPGA is the networking based or in you know, a cloud data centers, for example, you know, Microsoft and, you know, Cap Catapult and Brainwave project, you know, AWS is actually deploying loads of FPGA resources into their data centers and Intel uh, Xilinx is still, you know, competing in that kind of data center area. So what what's your insight? What's, what do you think of, you know, the FPGA role in the cloud data centers? Are they still a acceleration, uh, acceleration point or hardware, or they'll be the central point or whatever uh, in the in the data center? Yeah, um, well, I think so. I mean, I should first preface this by saying that it's not an active area of research for, for me, right? So, so you have to take my view as a kind of outsider on uh, on this. Um, I, I think, I, th I think, firstly, there's a probably a perception outside the FPGA world that FPGAs are coming to the data center, um, but. As you already mentioned, that's not really true. FPGAs are in the data center, right? So, um, so across uh, across all the um, uh, all the Microsoft um, Azure, you've got um, FPGA, 
you've got um, FPGAs in, uh, you've got the F1 instances in uh, AWS with Xilinx devices and so on. So, um, you know, I think it's already there. Uh, the question is, is really, I think the interesting thing for me and the work that I've seen is around um, where the FPGA sits in that system. So I think it's really interesting where the F, when the FPGA sits directly in the network, um, and so that commutes that some of the computation is done in a way that doesn't constantly require the fetching and going back to memory and, and so on. That, that's often the, the bottleneck in, in um, traditional computing devices. And so, you know, I'm generally interested in anything that pushes computation into unusual places, right? So um, network interfaces is one unusual place. Um, memory is another unusual place. Anywhere where you can push computation uh, so that it's closer to data, so that you get less data movement and more efficiency, I think is really interesting. Um, so I think there's still lots of interesting work happening there. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and I kind of look forward to, to seeing um, where, that, where that goes. But they are in the data center and they're there now and you can make use of them. Right? I think that's, that's great. No, we talk a lot, lot about hardware, but they're still a heavy research focus on the software part, especially because many people complaining like for the FPGA, they got there's so many advantages uh, for FPGAs, but the main drawbacks of FPGAs is really difficult to program. Um, so there, there's a lot of research since I was doing the PhD, you know, doing the high-level synthesis or the CAD tools or like I said, automated uh, designing thing. Is that still the case? Is that still the trend? Or, you know, what's the status of that kind of research? Yeah, it's, it's a good, another good question. So, um, so I described my research earlier in terms of um, automating design, and that's that's kind of a hardware view. Um, but from a software, if I was talking to a software engineer, I would say um, creating compilers, right? Um, so th th these are kind of two two ways of, of viewing um, viewing the, the the problem. So I guess. Just to take a step back, um, the thing that, that's exciting in this field for me right, is that in traditional compiler technology, what it's been about is you have a fixed architecture, you have uh, a language specification, and now how do I turn this language into an efficient implementation on this fixed architecture, right? Yeah. Whereas um, Developing design tools for FPGAs or compilers for FPGAs is a completely different story because what we're really interested in is how do I best design an architecture around this program, right? Which is kind of turning the whole problem inside out. Yeah, so it's a mindset that's change. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, so for me, that's that's always been the exciting thing, right? It's a completely different way of looking at, at the problem and it's looking at the problem inside out. So that suits an academic perspective anyway, right? Mm. Um, so um, this is not a new thing, right? So people have been talking about compiling um, software into hardware since the 1980s um, in some way or another. Uh, I think there's been a lot of steps forward though. Um, so the the probably the, the really, some of the really big steps um, have been things like um, things like the auto ESL tool um, that came out of um, Jason Kong's group and Juru Zhang's work um, at UCLA um, that, uh, that then got commercialized by Xilinx. Um, I think that's been hugely successful in terms of getting people using these tools, not as a novelty, but you know, as the actual way that they do hardware design, um, I think that the other big, uh, big direction that people have taken, including us, has been on um, on domain-specific tools. So, for example, um, my colleague Christos Baganis in the group has uh, work called FPGA ConvNet, where you can actually specify um, a CNN. Uh, a convolutional neural network at a at a very high level of abstraction and get an efficient implementation directly out. Now it doesn't work if your design is not a neural network because it's only for neural networks, right? But but um, but it works very well if your design is a neural network. And so um, I think these two directions have there've been a lot of practical progress. If we look at the question of generally mapping uh, 
arbitrary software into hardware, there's still things that are difficult and challenging to do, both at a practical and a, and a theoretical level. So um, going back to my research interests of memory, um, I'd point to things like, um, like uh, dynamic memory uh, allocation and use. Um, so for example, um, I've done work in trying to improve high level synthesis tools so that they, so that they can synthesize um, things like trees and linked list manipulating algorithms. Um, and, and we've been very successful there, but that hasn't yet made it into commercial tools. Mm. Um, there's still ways to go with that um, and, 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 and looking at how you can also optimize around the uncertainties that exist in program control flow is really interesting. So for mm. example, if I, if I provide um, a commercial high-level synthesis tool with a loop nest that's uh, simply, you know, for i is one to ten, for j is one to ten, and then you've got some um, array indexing in there that's straightforward. It'll do a pretty good job actually with 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 creating that. But now, if I if I throw in there um, some statements where the execution time depends on the values of the computation. Um, that are not known at compile time, then generally these tools tend to have to take a very conservative approach to the scheduling of the operations. And so, um, and so there's been uh, there's been some work recently rediscovering uh, ideas around dynamic scheduling in hardware. Um, but for me, the the interesting thing here is that if you look at if you look at my job, you know, as a hardware designer, which essentially the compiler is trying to mimic, um, what's, what's my job trying to do, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at that code and understand from that code, what's the most appropriate um, architecture. So that from a now trying to automate that problem, that's what a, a software engineer or a software, um, a computer scientist would call the static analysis problem. Yeah. It's static because you're not running the code you're looking at the code analyzing and yeah. from analyzing that code without running it you're trying to understand something about it and that something might be as simple as hey this instruction never touches this memory location so can i do something about that or it might be something as complex as uh, these this this thing can be extracted as a fully parallelized implementation according to this particular template and so on. So this link between static analysis of a program and custom hardware is super exciting, right? And, and I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to make the best of it, but we can still do a good job today. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. okay, that's very interesting. Because um, also, as you mentioned, the, um, the auto ESL has been there for ages, right? So, um, and and domain specific is the something that's quite interesting. Instead of solving the whole problem with one tool, like we can probably divide the area into certain small, you know, field and focusing on that specifically. Because many things, for example, the high-level synthesis may not be good at handling the networking related stuff, but we can create something more focused on it. I'm not sure if you're aware, it's like it's got some P4 language in the networking area, you know, not specifically for FPGA though, um, but many people are actually looking to it, to converting it, to creating tools or high-level design methods to mapping that to fit FPGAs, as you said, you know, by dividing and conquer rather than focusing on the generic, because design is being complex, you know, FPGAs has been evolving ages. It's not just simple programmable logic arrays. And it, it combines a lot of, you know, dedicated stuff for AIs or memories or networking and things. It's not as simple as so. Problem set is is in, increased and expanded. So um, that's probably why people are taking that measure. To my to my opinion. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so in addition to the stuff we're talking about, you know, especially ML and AI related thing, what do you think? You know, from a researcher point of view, from a professor point of view, um, what's the next? Uh, it's going to be right. So we always focus on the next. So I'm interested in the, in the next. Although you know, can be blur, can be. But what's your, what's your view on that? 
From my perspective, the interesting thing here is really taking a step back and, and, and saying, what do we see the future of computation being about, you know, in our society, actually? So it's a very big question, right? And it's not even just a purely a technical, one, yeah. not even just a purely technical question. Um, and so if you if you look at AI, ML today, um, then we spend a lot of time, you know, myself included, trying to make machines behave a bit more like humans. Um, and, and that's interesting, for sure. And it can be valuable. Mm -hmm. um, but, but really, having humans replaced by machines is never going to be, you know, our end goal, right? Yes. Um, what we really want as a society, I think, um, is to improve human the human condition, right? So what does that mean? It means, you know, more time for things that we enjoy, um, the ability to free us from things that are not creative mm -hmm. in order to do creative things, um, and automation of things that are not creative. Absolutely. Um, and so, so I would look to any tasks um, that involve the automation of such processes and so I think um, a there's a lot of scope for real-time computing which is where FPGAs really excel in all kinds of automation and robotics processes and so on um, which goes beyond today's AI and ML because today's AI and ML um, I mean there, there's there's work happening in that space but I mean today's mature AI and ML um, so anything where where we kind of use real-time computing to improve human lives whether that is in um, you know monitoring and diagnostics of uh, disease and aging right or, or through to actually just you know having a, a robot helper at home right all of these things I think are are really uh, are really key and many of them share the same, core challenges, which is we can't really achieve many of these things without having very low energy, very high performance computation. So I think those of us who are working in this field are really well suited to kind of push forward this boundary. Yeah. Very interesting. So not related to, again, not related to an application, but more focused on the underlying uh, problem itself. Right? Let's move on to uh, the next phase. Uh, so one of as many of my uh, viewers and audiences is actually students, and many of them is actually would like to pursue um, the academic uh, track or you know research. Um, but as a you know professor, um, so what do you think? Uh, so let's talk about PhD first. Like many people would like to become PhD, but recently many people argue like a PhD doesn't you know need it in many of the area you know if you go to industry you may, you may, need, you may not need a PhD degree to, to get into to get an engineering job so what do you think is the main advantages of a, a PhD um, specifically yeah so I, I think what a PhD program gives you is is a solid block of time to really explore um, deeply some ideas um, without the, the the constraints that you'll typically encounter in a in an industrial setting of um, time to market yeah. of um, issues around um, around ensuring of changing business units and uh, and how that might may affect you know what you're working on um, it, it provides you ultimately, I think a PhD provides you with the ability to go where your imagination leads, mm. right? And, and of course, um, the ability to, to work with people that you hopefully admire um, in order to, to help you uh, to bring out those ideas um, and that work. And so it's this, it's this solid time without external pressures that would move you away from reaching for the stars, if you like. Um, and I think this is really interesting. So in a sense, there are there are two times in a in a person's life that I've observed where people really have that opportunity um, if you take an academic if you take an industrial route. 
Okay. So there are two, if you, if you are planning to, to go into industry, um, there are really two times where I think industrial people have had that, that opportunity to reach for the stars that I've observed. The first one is before they start, if you do a PhD. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes, you know, they come back and do a PhD. So I've had some of my best PhD students have been people who've gone into industry and then come back, but it's harder. Um, so before you start, um, and there you have the, um, you may not have the experience to know what are the interesting problems, but you definitely have the intellect and you have the time, right? So I think there, if you compare yourself, if you, if you pair, pair up with a good supervisor who can help with the experience of what are the interesting problems, then I think you can make great progress. Then the other group of, of industrial people uh, who've, who, who've got that opportunity are those who are actually very senior and often quite old, you know, um, so they've reached the end of their career. Maybe they have titles like fellow, uh, you know, in some senior. And, and, and they've often kind of earned enough for the company um, that they're given the freedom to kind of explore whatever they want. And, and that's, that's a great position to be in as well if you want to, to do that exploration. But you tend not to have that opportunity when you're in your 20s. Um, and so the PhD is really probably the only opportunity you have when you're in your 20s to do that kind of work. Yeah, I, yeah, I would definitely yeah. agree because uh, when I think about uh, the PhD journey, it's more like I can gain the industry experience later. But if you want to gain the experience of a PhD, you probably don't have time at all in your life, as you said, unless you to you reach to a very very senior level or to the end of your career. But at that time, you probably don't have the drive or passions or um, motivations to do to spend a few years like and just solely on a research area. But in terms of that, how would you think to find love, passion, or research direction? So you mentioned about paired with a you know a supervisor, but for personal point of view. Uh, how do you think would be the you know ways to, to pursue? So I mean I think for me it's about exploration um, and curiosity. So you know even just these kind of discussions that you and I are having today, they they make me think about things, right? And they they, they make me think about things maybe from a different perspective. So maybe tomorrow I'm going to start working on a slightly different problem <laughs> right, because of our discussion today and I think the that I that the idea of exploring um, everything that you encounter um, to be curious uh, to talk to people about it right in the way we're, we're doing now um, and I do think you know picking an advisor who's on the same wavelength as you right so someone who's excited about the same stuff that excites you is important um, uh, these things are, are really how to to build that 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 passion. Um, I would say that the key thing really is, and this goes for also before you would start a PhD, even as a as an undergraduate student. Um, if you're taught, so people are taught in different ways, right? But let's say you're taught, oh, you design a digital circuit by uh, building a Carnot map of this thing, right? So. Um, there are two ways that students tend to react to that, right? One is they say, okay, I must uh, memorize this way of doing this. And then if I repeat it in the exam, I'll get good marks. Yeah. And, and that's fine. Another way is to say, why are the, why should the axes of a Carnot map be labeled in the way they are? And what happens if I do it a different way? What's the impact of that? Um, and does this only work for Boolean values? Or could I put like some other data type in there and still get the same result? And if you always kind of ask these questions, um, why is it done this way? Could I change the way it's done? And could I generalize this? So, okay, it works for this, but is there some bigger group of problems that this that this technique could solve if you always ask that then i think you naturally build this kind of research and passion and interest in your in your field okay yes yeah, so i do absolutely agree so i think uh, asking learning is not a 
one way road is actually two ways. You can't learn if you don't create or if you don't asking. You know why and how can I apply? Yeah, and、it? I think I think from a、uh, you know as a, as a teacher, I think this is really the joy of a PhD from my side, right? So to, to have PhD students, this this is really the joy because you know we have two hundred. Students in per year in our undergraduate course, and I would love to be able to have that one-to-one discussions about these things with all of them. There's no chance, right, to have to have that with 200 students. So you find other ways of doing it, and you do it with groups and so on. But with PhD students, you can. So so this is the real opportunity. So instead of it being a transmission of of knowledge, it becomes a community. That we both play our roles to develop our knowledge together. I'm not going to pass you the knowledge. We're going to develop it together. That's exciting to me. Another question is, like you said, you got 200 students or undergraduate students, but、uh, is the PhD for everyone?、So、I, I I know the answer probably is not no.、Uh, what do you think? <laughs> right, right.、Um, I mean, look, so. You can be a you can be a very good engineer without a PhD. It's true, absolutely. Yeah,、um, and and so、um, so there are kind of two prerequisites for for、um, PhD. Number one is you want to you want to do research, and doing research is not the same as doing engineering, right? I mean, you can do research in engineering, but it's not the same thing as doing engineering. So、um, you need to、uh, you need to to have an inventive Uh, perspective, right? So I'm interested in developing new things.、Um, so that's not true for everyone,、um, and there's nothing wrong with with it if you're if that's not really your interest.、Um, but also, you just need to be passionate about your field, right? So、um, if you、uh, if you if you Really passionate about your area, then you generally want to improve your area, not just work in your area. And so, this idea of improving your area is is essentially research. So, I, I think、um, there's there's a kind of there's a passion side of it, and there's also、um, there's also an inventiveness side of it. And if you've got both of these, then you've got the prerequisites to do PhD. Now, then the question is, do you want to do PhD? And of course, you know, different people have different different views on that. So,、um, you know, some, sometimes there are financial reasons that it's not the right thing for you to do, and that's completely completely fine, right?、Um, yeah. But you know, sometimes it, you have that that freedom, and if you have that freedom,、uh, you know, there's there's a fairly limited window. So I would say grab it, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So,、uh, so yeah, I totally agree. So it's not. Um, for 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 many people or for everyone to pursue it, but it's not impact your innovations or passion or tr- driving you to pursue. Like you said, you know, improve your field. You don't have to be a PhD to improve your field, but、uh, but you can be. You know, do that. You know, at any positions and stuff. You know.、um, so yeah, that's probably all from me.、Uh, thank you very much today for you know have a have a chat with me. It's very insightful.、Um, you know. Perspectives and thinking, so all that kind of technology mindset, you know, future trend and research and academic and things. Thank you very much, George.、Uh, today. Well, thank you, thank you, and it's been been great talking to you as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you, and take care. 好了，以上就是本期视频的全部内容。有用请点赞，喜欢请关注。我是老师，我们下期视频再见。<音乐>